Do you hear that? That's the Baptism River gurgling right underneath me. Hi there, my name is Joe Velovsky. I'm a naturalist here at Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center, which is in northern Minnesota, and actually the town nearest us is Finland, Minnesota. What a great place to enjoy and explore winter. And that's what I'd like to do with you, is take you to some of my favorite places and show you some of the interesting things that are around here in winter. It's the middle of February. The last time that it was above 32 degrees was the middle of December. Actually, just a couple days ago, it was 31.5. That was the high temperature. And so it's cold here, huh? But that's what makes winter so interesting, is that it's extreme. And so the things that can survive here and, and the ways that we survive here are different than some other places. That's what I'd like to show you. So there's a series of videos that I'll link to and you'll be able to see and hear a little bit of what goes on here in northern Minnesota during winter. We'll have a good adventure. It's almost winter, 9.59 a.m. Central. That'll be the winter solstice. Almost. Nice! <laughs> oh, that was beautiful! Mach 3? 3! He's got 3! Oh, God. I don't, I'm a too afraid. Emily, we want to get this on video. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. That's actually a good idea. <laughs> Does that video have yep, sound? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should I go <laughs> Oh goodness. <laughs> Lori, that was way more graceful yeah. than the other two. Yes. There's also the most That's a little genuine question there before we get baptized. I thought you were going in for a second there. I thought so too. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to edit out that second there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Twice. I'll get lots of that when you're skiing on this uh, river.
work. Huh? Good work. This is exactly why we're here. This is where somebody's going in. Bumpy butt. Alright. Bumpy butt. Oh. Icy bump. Oh. How's that? Not terrible. Not terrible. Lay on. On belay. Hold on good. Adult ready? <laughs> adult ready? <laughs> Is there an adult somewhere here? <laughs> we, need, we need an adult. <laughs> oh, we, oh, we got a Sam and Charlie. No adults. <laughs> well, it snowed a little bit last night. And uh, we're sitting at about 33 inches of snow right here in the yard. And that's how you clear the driveway. Though there may not be a lot of bird diversity during our winter. There certainly are a lot of chickadees. You gotta be
be tough. Gotta be able to find the food. Most of our bird species migrate south for the winter. Chickadees, pine grosbeaks, common red poles, downy and hairy woodpeckers. There might be about 15 or 20 species of birds around here during the winter. So yesterday, we came out here and found some otter tracks. Found it across the entire island. It was out on a different island, came across the lake, crossed over this island, and then went straight for an old beaver lodge. Straight into the beaver lodge. We checked it again later that day, and uh, it hadn't left. So I'm going to check it out right now, see if it's still there. River otters stay active all winter. Oh, and here's the slide from yesterday. There it is going off into the woods and it followed this trail. Let's see if we can get down here. Come out here. Close to the old beaver lodge right now. This is where it went in. Right here. I don't see any tracks coming out.
Do you see in there? All those crystals, that's from the river otter breathing. And I can smell in there too. Wow, that's cool. Well, here I am on the edge of Poplar Lake, which borders the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. If you're gonna go anywhere to enjoy winter, this is one of the places. This is really shaped by winter. The, all the plants that are here are hardy down to minus 40 and colder, and it almost seems like there's no animals here at all. I know they are. I just followed a river otter over there. But you know, I wonder every once in a while why winter? It's sunny outside right now. It should be warm, but it's minus 12 degrees right now. And why is that? If you look at the way that the Earth rotates around the, the sun, you'll see that the northern hemisphere during what we call winter is actually, the entire Earth is actually closer to the sun. Shouldn't it be warmer? But actually what happens is that there's the tilt of the Earth as well. And that tilt makes all the difference. During our summer, the northern hemisphere summer, the tilt is such that we're more directly facing the sun. And so most of that energy is, is funneled right down to one small area. Whereas in the winter time, we're tilted away. And so that energy is spread out over a, a larger area. So there's less energy per unit area in the winter, in our winter. See the other thing about the sun in winter here is that it's very low on the horizon. It's actually fairly high right now here in mid-February, but super low. Made it to the Portage Trail. Ready to ski into the Banadad Ski Trail. Wow. Through some northern white cedars, black spruce. Maybe I'll see a moose. That'd be amazing, huh? Well, except for this ski trail right here, there doesn't seem to be much animal activity in the woods. There's three ways that animals respond to winter. One is to migrate. A lot of birds head south, right? They're heading south partly for warmth, I suppose, but mostly for their food. Then there's another way that some animals cope with it. They go into a deep sleep or a hibernation of some sort. Now both of those strategies, uh, they clearly work, but they also have some disadvantages. As you fly thousands of miles, uh, the place that you're headed may not be there anymore. Maybe somebody went in and logged the entire area or built something there. You never know if a storm could have come through or there could be storms along your path. It's hard to find food along the way. You just have to go a long ways. And if you find a spot to sleep all winter, well, predators may find you. Or it just may be that you didn't eat enough before you went to sleep. So then there's the last strategy, and that's resistance. They resist the winter, kind of like what I'm doing. Put on more layers, stay active, eat different foods. Chickadees, river otters, moose. They're built for this kind of a winter. Let's keep skiing. And the plants that are here, well, they have to adapt to a lot of different stressors as well. In addition to the cold and the freezing temperatures, they also have to deal with snow load. They have to deal with 
a lack of moisture. I mean, it's all frozen, right? And so this is essentially a cold desert for them. And then herbivory. Now, I'm sure there's many other things, but those are four that really stand out. And so these plants that are surviving are adapted to that. So I've been talking about how great this year has been. The snowfall, how we continually just get great snow, and the temperatures have been low. So I've come out here to this mixed hardwood forest to figure out what's going on in our snowpack, to dig down to get a snow profile. Because as many inches of snow has fallen, Every single time that we get a snowfall, it compresses the snow below it. And then the warmth from the earth rises and changes the conditions of this snowpack. We're going to dig from the surface all the way down to the subnivian zone. And then we'll look at what's going on in this, in this snow profile. So here we are. It's a three foot snowpack right out here in this forest. And it's certainly different here than it would be in an evergreen forest. And we'll go there and explore just a little bit as well. But I just wanted to show you the depth of the snow here. And then to kind of look down, you can see this log that has fallen and rotting away a little bit. It's, ser it's, it's serving as a little bit of a home perhaps to some small mammals. And here we are in the subnivian zone. Subnivian being below all of this snow. The conditions are very different. 
If we were to measure the temperatures here, I wouldn't be surprised if it's about 15 degrees above, right here, right now, uh, but that if we were able to get down lower into this and measure in the subnivian zone, it may be in the high 20s or maybe even low 30s. The humidity in there uh, is, is very different than above. It's extremely dry up here in the cold desert of sorts, but down here it's really moist. And so it provides a very different environment for the animals and the plants that are down here. I, I don't know if you can really see it on this video, and I'll, I'll get some pictures to be able to share with you as well. But this conditions, the conditions right down here are very crystalline. And, and so that's because this warmth from the earth is coming up and, and melting some of that. Now, as that melts and it turns into uh, water vapor, that it starts going up through the snow column until it freezes at a particular point. Now, I can't tell you exactly where that is, but my guess is that it's right along in this layer right here, right at about the seven inch level. But I can see, and some of this is because of the, the way that my shovel interacted with the snow, but I can see that there's a different texture all the way up to right about there. And so that may be another zone of where some of this humidity has gone up and frozen and created a little ice layer right there. And then this is all the very soft, fluffy snow. Yeah, yeah, it actually looks different here. So an even better way to look at this, to check out the snow layers, is to take a knife or a credit card or something like that and slice through the snow and see if you can feel the different layers. So let's start here at the top. As we go down, oh, there's a layer right there. So I can put a little popsicle stick right in at that layer. And as I break through that layer, Oh, there's a layer right there. Yeah, that was the layer I had seen already. And so what we've got are two little ice layers right here. Let's see if we can do that again. So we come down, boom, hit that, go beyond that, slice right on through, and it goes all the way on down. I can feel the difference in the texture. It's getting more dense here. And then I hit the next layer Go down below that, and there's nothing. But each layer has different qualities. Let's see here. At about the 6-inch layer, and about the 27-inch layer, are where we have little ice lenses here. You can try this at home, too. doesn't matter how thick your snow layer is. You should be able to find something. I walked not too far away from where our snow pit was, right over to just these tiny little spruce trees here. And we're going to find out that the snow conditions are quite different. Now there's a snowshoe hare, at least one of them, that's been spending a lot of time in this area. Can't help but wonder if it lives right underneath here. But you can see that even just directly underneath these spruce trees, that the branches are adapted so that they actually bend to the snow load and they create a little shelter there, which the snowshoe hare has taken advantage of. You can see the scat that's right here and the tracks. They've been eating some of these branches. This is their home. Well, let's check out the snow depth here. Right underneath this spruce tree, you know that it's 36 inches just, just right around here. But how deep is it? <laughs> 26 inches is all. 26 inches. And so that's a good 10 inch difference, right? That the snowshoe hare has created a little bit of a den down there. Oh my gosh. So maybe you can see nice and close the scat that's down there. I'm gonna put the camera in here. Let's see if we can get inside. That's where it lives. Down there in that subnivian zone taking advantage of the insulation that the snow provides. It's even more obvious that these spruce trees change what's possible underneath it, making homes for a variety of animals.
clearly the snowshoe hare spent some time here too. Wow. In fact, I can't help but wonder if it's around here someplace. How many? Came down to the Lake Superior shoreline. It's early March, and here we are, northern Minnesota. The Indian, inland lakes are completely covered in ice, two to three feet of ice, depending on the lake. Out here on Lake Superior, we're only just starting to see ice form on the shoreline, at least right here. There are some March or even late February weeks in the past where I've been able to go ice skating just as far as you can see. It's not going to happen this year, but I'm not giving up yet. I still want to get out there and explore. I'm listening to the ice rise and lower. You can see the evidence of the giant waves all winter that have been crashing along these cliffs, forming all this ice. Now that we're ending winter, the lake is starting to freeze on this side of the shore. It takes all winter to cool it down. I can hear it still rising and lowering just a little bit. You can see right behind me here that the ice was forming here, and this is probably from a seep, right? And that it came down and then formed on where the beach was. And that beach has since been washed away and the ice remains. So there must have been some big waves here washing some of this rock away. These beaches keep being formed and then destroyed and formed and destroyed. You can see the ice all the way up there and all the way back down. Different colors depending on where the water was coming from. Let's walk over and look at this. This is definitely a different color. I don't think I'm walking on that ice. Sometimes I've been down here and it's been over a foot thick at this time of year. That's uh, an inch, maybe? <laughs> Not very thick at all. I guess I need to back up. And the ice is very different here than it was over in Crystal Bay. Spencer and I came down here to check out the trail camera, see if there were any wolf pictures on there. I don't know yet, we're gonna take it back and look. But it certainly looks like there's some sort of canine that's been walking along the shoreline here. The snow is so much shallower, maybe this is an easier place to walk. Or, because we saw lots of different signs of deer, maybe this is a good place to hunt. Certainly is a good place to hunt if you're looking for ice, huh? What a beautiful picture. The ice that I broke yesterday. I can stand on it now.
is solid. Wolf and Raven Lakes. We're headed right down there. See the big cliffs and the lake? Maybe you can even see one of the houses down there. We're going to go down there, the dark houses where people go ice fishing. <laughs> well, this gives you a sense of how deep the snow is. That sign is uh, normally above my head. And now... Well, we've made it down here. Wolf Lake and here's some of our dark houses here you can see three of them right over there and these three here two two sets a little village down here let's walk in one of them It'll get dark at first you can clearly see why it's called the dark house huh and we drill a hole right here in the floor so that we can see down into the lake and fish as well and though you can't see it right now, perhaps, I can see the bottom of the lake. It's not too far away. You see that green glow, of course, and that is because the light is going through all of the snow and ice and getting down there. And here's the odd thing. You know, in wintertime, we kind of think that everything shuts down and waits it out. It turns out that a lot of things in the lake might do that, but not everything. Some things continue on growing, even plants and, you know, algae and that type of stuff, is that there's enough sunlight that gets through the snow and ice that it keeps running down there. Now, of course, the ice is 32 degrees or colder, right? But the water, clearly, if it's liquid, is 32 degrees or warmer. And so the animals that are living in there are not freezing like up above. I'll take you to a forest as well, where we can see that some of the things have frozen. But right down here, there's a lot of animals that might be down there doing just fine. My eyes need to adjust. It was really bright when I stepped outside. But what I want to do is find a spot where we can drill a hole. It'll take a little while, but I'm going to use the power auger and we're just going to be able to drill down. We'll find out how thick the ice is.
So now that we've drilled a hole into the ice, I can take this meter stick right here, clearly what, 35, 36, 37, 38 inches. It's 39 inches all the way to the top. Let's see how thick our ice is. You notice that there's this bar on here so I can catch the bottom of the ice and pull it up and see how thick it is. So as we go down, we went down a long ways. There you go. So our ice is 30, 34 inches of ice. 34 inches of ice, that's what we got. Wow. Yeah. Here at the end of winter, it's had all that time to just keep building up ice. And there's life down there. So we saw these Voyager canoes from out there on the lake. Each of them can hold 20 people paddling on the big lake. Now the Historically, the voyagers would have stored these canoes under the lake. It's the safest place to be. It's cold, it's not going to rot, tree's not going to fall on it, uh, ice isn't going to damage it because it's liquid down there. And so in the fall they would have sunk these canoes below a lake, let it freeze, and in the spring as the ice was coming off then they would be able to send somebody out there uh, to swim and start to pull the canoes out, which was probably a, an ordeal. We don't store ours that way. We haven't really addressed the botany in this area yet. In all of the adventures, I've been able to go through the forest, but I never really addressed it directly. And I, I think I need to take a moment to do that. So you'll notice around here, a lot of balsam fir, white spruce, there's some aspens. Well, we got a few maples just right over here. Don't know why they're there, but they are. There's not a lot of diversity. I mean, there is, but compared to uh, tropical rainforests, this just pales in comparison. And the place really exists because of its winters. That's the limiting factor for around here. Well, that and I suppose the soil, but the soil is limited because of the winters as well. But uh, what we find is that there are certain plants that thrive in this area because they're able to freeze down to minus 40 and colder. This particular winter never got that cold. In fact, it was a relatively warm winter. And at the same time, the numbers will show that it was a relatively cold winter that it stayed down near the minus 20s uh, for quite some time and, and hovered around there and never really got warm. We didn't really have that thaw, though that's coming up here in a couple days. But um, the, the, the plants are able to survive uh, around here because they can freeze down to minus 40 and colder. Certain species right at the southern range of this area here, the boreal forest, uh, that they can't freeze down to minus 40. That, that seems to be a sort of a magical number. Magical number for the plants, uh, the ones that can freeze and the ones that can't, but then also for uh, various uh, invasive pests. Now, some invasive pests are native, uh, and uh, that's just, just what happens in that they live around here, but minus 40 still kind of limits them. Uh, but their population will boom and bust and boom and bust. Then there are things like the emerald ash borer, uh, which... Uh, is not native to North America. It's been spotted in Minnesota now. It started out on the East Coast, uh, but uh, it's here. And if we don't get temperatures down to minus 40 uh, that last for several hours, uh, then, then uh, those particular insects can survive a winter and they can keep advancing. And uh, it's, it's a concern. It's a great concern. They may kill all of the black ash in the forest around here. And so that will change the complexity of uh, the area. We've been having a lot of uh, insect infestations in the spruce budworm, which is a caterpillar that turns into a moth. 
and that is native, uh, but that's been going around and here in the Finland area. In fact, maybe you can see a few of the trees here have been hit by that and uh, probably this next summer, some of the rest will get hit by that. Uh, up in Isabella, which is a little ways away from here, uh, almost all of the uh, spruce and balsam fir uh, are are dying off. Just very few are surviving. They'll be the ones that set seed and be able to grow the forest back. But around here, uh, we haven't quite died off yet. It's possible that we'll be spared. But then again, maybe the, all this forest will be brown at the end of summer. Hard to tell. Let's see if we walk right over here. Can't quite tell. Oh, look at this. If we walk right here, and you notice that little spot right there, that's spruce budworm, and that I can actually see the exuvia of the of the uh, caterpillar that, that kind of molts and goes through that, and there's this little web that it weaves, in it, and it just eats the growing edge. And so it doesn't kill the tree outright, uh, but it, it does it year after year after year, and then the tree will die. Yeah, I can see a bunch in here right now just as that is going to be killing the trees, there are Cape May warblers uh, that will come and live in this area. Amazing warblers will come live in this area because they eat this. And as then these die off here and the population moves off to a different part of the forest, so will the birds. Well, I wanted to also touch on the lichens that grow here. Northern Minnesota is really known for its lichen diversity. Um, it's not necessarily because this area has the, the, the nutrients or the sunlight or the temperatures that lichens need. It's that there's uh, less competition from other things. And so what will happen is a spruce or a balsam fir might die and then the lichens will colonize the dead branches and survive on there. So there's lots of species here, as you see. But if we go over to the sugar maple right here, these two sugar maples, you can see that the bark is completely covered. In fact, there was a time when I was uh, interpreting some lichens for a group of naturalists here in northern Minnesota, and one of the guys who was in his late 50s, he, he, he raised his hand after I had talked to him a little bit, and he said, Joe, okay, now that I fully understand what a lichen looks like, can you tell me what the bark looks like? <laughs> Oh my goodness, and it's true. I can't really say that I'm seeing the bark of these sugar maple trees. These lichens and mosses are just growing on there completely, completely covering them. Pretty amazing. But uh, there are a few things that lichens really need. One of them is clean air, and we happen to have clean up air up here in northern Minnesota. Not a lot of industry or uh, air pollution. Here we are walking out of the spruce fir forest, some nice paper birches for a little bit, and then you'll notice that these evergreens and the paper birches are replaced by almost exclusively sugar maples. Well, of course, here in northern Minnesota, our sugar maples are definitely smaller. They're growing season and the soil is just not conducive to growing like the sugar maples that we would expect out in Vermont and New Hampshire. But these are all sugar maples. They're about 80 years old right in here. 80 year old sugar maple in Vermont and New Hampshire would be huge compared to these. <laughs> these are really tiny. Uh, and why is it that they're able to grow here? Well, they're able to grow here because of Lake Superior. That Lake Superior tempers the temperatures here. And so it rarely gets to minus 40 or colder right up here on top of the hill as the warm air from Lake Superior blows across this ridge. But you go just a couple miles inland uh, towards Isabella and uh, that, that Lake Superior doesn't have much of an impact on it anymore. And so it's much colder, can get much colder there. 20 degrees colder easily on a particular evening. It might be 20 below here and 40 below in there. So there's kind of our saving grace that we might have the invasive species that hit us because of Lake Superior, but inland, maybe they'll be saved. Maybe they'll have those minus 40 degree temps. It's almost time to tap our sugar maples here. I, I, let's go walk here. I'll show you what I mean. That once we start to have the melting from around the trees, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about here, that melting right there, 
once we start to get that melting, then that means that the trees are almost We're experiencing ready. the dreaded wintry mix. You can probably see all the frost on the branches right here of this beaked hazel. As this continues, the frost and possibly ice will form on branches of all the different types of trees. And some trees that are adapted to bend will do just fine. And those that aren't, well, they'll start to lose some branches. We'll see how this progresses. It doesn't take much snow to get me excited. I love coming out in the snow and looking at the snowflakes as they're falling down. There's so many different types. And the snowflakes can tell us about what is going on way up there in the atmosphere. Oh, do you hear the pileated woodpecker? Very fun. It can tell us what's going on up in the atmosphere and uh, what's to come. Now, this isn't much snow falling right now, and yet the snowflakes are fun to look at, whether it's be on my gloves or on my jacket. You may have heard of Snowflake Bentley fellow who took pictures of snowflakes. That inspired me. Now he had some fancy equipment to be able to take the pictures. All you need is a camera and a little know-how. So what I do is I take my point-and-shoot camera and when I catch a really nice snowflake someplace where it looks really interesting to me, then I quick get a picture. Now it's not just about taking a picture like that. No, you've got to figure out the mechanics of this to keep your camera uh, very still and to also be able to get close enough. And so I've set my camera in a particular way. I take my finger, you see how I hold my finger right against it? And I also hold the camera against my arm and I can then half click to get it to focus and take a picture. That way if my hand moves up and down, even a very small amount, the camera is still with it. Let's see if I can get some good pictures here. I really enjoy watching the snowflakes change throughout the course of a snowstorm. This particular snowstorm isn't going to last long. It's just little flurries right now. But uh, sometimes you can watch them change over the course of hours and it can tell you what's going on up there in the upper atmosphere. Oh, there's a nice snowflake. Ooh, I'm following fox tracks up here. Down there is the village on Wolf Lake. Made it to the overlook. And out before us is Lake Superior. It's hard to tell where there's ice and where there's water. They say that 
It's over 60% frozen. I feel like I see some shimmering water further out there. And then there's some spots where clearly it's ice. I'm not certain if it's floating around or if it's connected to land. I don't know. Beautiful. And as we come to the end of this video, we're also coming to the end of winter. Spring is in 13 days. Doesn't look like it though, does it? Yep, 13 days. And with that, weather will change. I think about our climate and our weather, and climate is changing as well, right? But here's the thing is that weather might be compared to the clothes you choose to wear on a particular day. Whereas climate is the clothes you choose to have in your wardrobe. And so it's a longer story. And just as our weather is about to change for spring, the climate changed uh, at the end of the ice age. So 10, 12,000 years ago, uh, there were glaciers here one to two kilometers thick and they started receding as it was warming up and just as that was happening it was opening up a barren land rock there was no soil here and so plants and animals started migrating in yeah plants migrated in it's pretty slow but they started doing that and just as that happened during climate change right now this climate change is human induced climate change uh, plants and animals are going to have to adapt and they're going to migrate and I know that further up the shore a little ways that the US Forest Service is planning some uh, plantings of oak that they want to make it climate adaptive forestry and that they're trying to leap forward and help the oaks migrate because that's what is predicted to be here my goal in this series of videos wasn't to answer questions so much as it was to inspire questions. I wanted to take you on adventures so that you could see the Northwoods in winter. And so I may have answered a few questions, but I also hope that I inspired some new questions. And when we meet, I hope that you ask your questions. I have a lot of different resources that I'm going to be sharing then to help to interpret some of what I've shown you. For example, the frozen lake out there. How often does it freeze over? How much does it freeze over? How does it compare to other Great Lakes? Our temperatures here, the animals. So much of our landscape is dictated by this season, winter. And though winter technically only lasts three months, here it seems like it lasts about six months. I personally love that. I know that some people don't and they choose to live in other places, but this is a marvelous place to live if you enjoy winter. So I look forward to seeing you soon. Enjoy.